I became a Christian at the age of 17. At 17 years old, I uh, started a relationship with Jesus. My brother, uh, a couple of weeks before that, had accepted Christ and uh, he came into the household one night. Uh, kind of shocked me and told me that, you know, his life has changed and that, uh, that he would never be the same, that we would get along, that, that things were going to be different from then on. He didn't have to say too many verses. He didn't have to uh, try to convince me. He just lived it. For a whole month at that household, my brother Javier showed me that there was really an, an interchange in him. So out of curiosity, I wanted to see what happened. So I told him I would go and uh, follow him to this church. It was called Calvary Chapel, and the pastor there was Raul Reese. So sure enough, that night I go and uh, the message hit me. I tried not to, uh, you know, rush into things that night and it took another week for me to go back and throw myself down and give my life to Christ. That was my beginning, the beginning to my journey. I accepted Christ. I wasn't ashamed about approaching people. You know, I saw people walking around and I was the first one to be like, hey man, Jesus loves you. I was a little, I guess, weird, you would say that right, right now. Uh, in high school, I, I wasn't the, uh, the jock. You know, I wasn't good at any sports. I, uh, I did wrestle, but, you know, there was a guy in my weight who was like a CIF champion, so I couldn't beat him. So I didn't really excel, but I remember that watching a friend of mine one day, and he started doing this thing that they called popping. This was a, a type of dance that they had in the West Coast, and I thought it was cool, so I started practicing. And sure enough, when I saw that, uh, you know, girls liked a good dancer, I told myself I was going to be the best dancer ever. And um, I started competing. We would go from high school to high school, battling in those days and battling other dancers. And uh, that's how my career started. I was, a, I was a street dancer. I was what you call a popper. And uh, when breakdance took that to the next level and became this global phenomenon, I was there at the right time as an extra in these little breakdance movies. And I was all excited. And I was like, man, I was just happy that I could go back in that theater and see myself for about two seconds and go, hey, you know, that's me, mom. It was an exciting time in my life. I loved it. I uh, made a living out of it for a long time. Uh, I remember going to clubs and I was only like 18, 19 years old. I couldn't get into clubs that were 21, but I had a friend of mine who had this fake idea that kind of looked like me. I would get in here and there. So I started competing and making uh, money at these dance contests. And I would go to auditions and I could see that there were other people competing for the same, uh, you know, dancing roles that there were. Back in those days, there was this um, TV show called Dance Fever. And my friend told me, man, why don't you try to get in this? So a friend of mine and I started doing, re, you know, we would rehearse and, and we would, you know, we wanted to see if we could make it. And sure enough, we, uh, we won the, the city competition and won the state competition. We represented California. In 1985, myself and, uh, and my partner named Paul, we uh, won first place, $50,000 when I was 19 years old. I remember I was studying to be an accountant in those days and uh, I had told my dad, Dad, I said, I don't want to be an accountant no more. I want to be a dancer. And he probably almost strangled me that day, but when he saw that I was doing well, and especially after I won $50,000, he said, get on, you know, try to live your dream. Just don't forget, you can always, you know, have this accounting degree as a, as a backup. And I did, you know, I, uh, I went out there with for it. You know, the day that we won, the day we win Dance Fever, not only was I happy because I got $50,000, but they invited us to this after party. And I remember Danny Terrio taking me uh, to this party and uh, Rick James was there. And I saw the way girls reacted to Rick. So I told myself, man, I'm liking this fame thing. Maybe this is for me. Little by little, man, I, I would audition for things and uh, I would get, you know, certain roles and little parts, little bit pieces until I started getting acting roles. You know, I was always, always thinking to myself, say, God, this is awesome, man. Thank you for opening these doors. And little by little, man, I was getting this and that and that and, and uh, thinking that God was opening up all those doors. And one thing you need to know is that a lot of times God doesn't open all those doors. We tend to think that it's a blessing from God, but a lot of times, you know, the enemy is so wise and smart that uh, he tends to make you believe that. And little by little, you start thinking, gosh, man, I'm talented. Gosh, man, I must be, I'm the bomb. And you start giving yourself all this credit, and little by little, you start forgetting about God, and it becomes more about you 
and about what you can do, uh, the things you can accomplish. And uh, you know, your ego just starts growing. So there I was, you know, this young kid uh, that I had won a, you know, a big dance contest getting into movies now. And one day I got called in to audition for this movie. You know, the guy was like asking me, I said, you know, uh, so do you act? And I was like, yeah, sure. I had never taken an acting class before. I got the job. I remember six weeks after that, I, I uh, flew to Dallas to film the first movie ever, which was Winners Take All. As I was filming that movie in Dallas, they sent me another script for a movie called Can't Buy Me Love. And then I met the director when I came back into Los Angeles. Man, that was that. I, I got the job. I, I was filming Can't Buy Me Love with Patrick Dempsey. Sure enough, again, another script came by and it was the movie Colors with Sean Penn. I got that. I started working, you know, steadily as an actor. Listen, Holmes. You see, man, that's just the way the world is, is it? It's always gonna be gangs, man. It's always gonna be fighting. But after a while, man, uh, I was just thinking, man, you know, all these roles that I do, it's always about the Latin guy's the bad guy, the Latin guy's the gang member, the Latin guy's the drug dealer, the Latin guy. I had done every one of those roles. I was even in an episode with Johnny Depp for 21 Jump Street playing his nemesis. I was this gang member. I did every gang member role you could think of. I just wanted to be different. So one day, uh, my friend and I were hanging out and I said, man, I'm gonna start rapping. He was like, you never rapped before, but no, but it's the music that I love. I danced to all this hip hop rap music. Why, why can't I rap? And so I took it on man, and uh, it worked. I was in Acapulco doing a movie and I decided to ask the director, actually the, my paycheck, I gave it to the director and told him, hey man, can you, can you film this video of this song that I put together called Rico Suave? And we did, shot the video, got it there, came back to the States, got it cut, uh, gave it to a friend, um, gave some music to another friend. I ended up at the, the studio for Michael Cimbello, uh, who had just, you know, recently had done Flashdance, the, the, the soundtrack, he was his big producer then. And um, his lawyer became my lawyer, and they brought me in to Jimmy Iovine and Ted Fields. Uh, who were thinking about opening up a, uh, a label called Interscope. Again, I'm like, God, this is from God. This, is, this must be amazing. I said, God, you know, you got me covered. You know, make, help me make the right decision. I remember I had another offer from Island. It was between Island Records and, and Interscope. And uh, I just remember my, my lawyer saying, man, this, this guy, Jimmy, man, he's, you know, he, he's, he's a go-getter. He's, he's going to do well for you if you sign with him, you know. They're really gonna support you. And sure enough, I did. And I was the first artist out of Interscope Records with a half Latin, half English song called Rico Suave. And as soon as I got there, man, they got it to the people at MTV and MTV loved it. And they put it in a high rotation. And here I am, this young kid, you know, from one day to another, people are recognizing me. I, I was just happy. I was going to Tower Records and, 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 uh, and on Sunset Boulevard and I would go over there and be like, man, this is my record. Mom, look, here's my CD. But little by little, in a couple of weeks, that song was everywhere because when uh, MTV was playing that video, they had it in a high rotation and uh, nobody expected that, not me. I was just happy that you know, I put out a song. The success of Rico Suave has created a lot of intrigue around this very charismatic Latin star. We caught up with him while he was auditioning dancers for his upcoming tour. I'm sure they're gonna like it. I was, you know, but I didn't know it was gonna appeal to everybody else, especially because it's a, you know, half English, half Spanish song. You know, and uh, you got to the point where uh, you walk in the streets and everybody's saying, "Yo, Rico." For that to blow up, man, it, it was, it was, uh, you know, I thought it was just God. K Power 106 FM, Kodak and Save On Drug. Picture the joy of coming home. And on board, morning personality Monica Brooks, Capitol Records recording artist Tracy Spencer, and Interscope recording artist Gerardo. And Gerardo, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Nice to have you in our parade, my friend. Well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here. And uh, I'm happy this is, this is history in the making, and um, I'm glad I'm a little part of it. You know, that's exactly right. This is an historic event. Over a million people have lined the boulevards of Hollywood today. 
See, I knew the story of King Solomon in the Bible when I was young. You know, I remember that uh, God had asked him, you know, in a dream, you know, what, 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 what would you like? And he said, give me wisdom so I can lead your people, right? And then God just blessed him so much and said, you're going to be the richest ever. King Solomon was the richest man that ever lived. King Solomon had 300 wives, 700 concubines. King Solomon was probably the most famous ever as a king, uh, most successful king. He had everything. But if you read Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 1 or 2, it says, I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. He says, God gives people wealth, possessions, and honor to their heart's desire, but He does not give them the ability to enjoy them, and others enjoy them instead. And that's where I was at. I had all these things that the world was throwing at me, and I wasn't happy. So I get an invitation from the Make-A-Wish Foundation to go to Estapa, Mexico for a fundraiser. And uh, I decided to go. There were other celebrities going, so why not? Um, and I got in there and uh, I ran into this girl. There were all these models there. But I ran into this girl who I thought was too tall for me, but she was beautiful, blue eyes. And, you know, I was thinking, wow, you know, if, if I have a child with this woman, you know, be taller and, you know, dark skin, blue eyes. And I was, you know, I went to that dream stage. And uh, sure enough, we, we started talking and, um, we left, uh, you know, she went her ways and I went my way and went back to the Enrico Suave. But a couple of weeks later, we ran into each other in Los Angeles at a club. And she told me she was moving over there because she was going to start doing some modeling there. So I was like, awesome, you know, and, uh, you know, three months later, she's pregnant. And uh, I was, I was kind of excited because uh, I just needed something in my life to to inspire me again. I mean, a baby I, it was perfect. You know, I, when I was on tour, I used to take my little sister everywhere and I just thought it'd be a, a, a new thing in my life to give me inspiration. So I welcomed it and, you know, she was, she was content as long as I was content. In those days, you know, fame kind of blinds you and at that moment, Kathy would basically do anything I wanted to do. And there were times that I had to go to the record release party of my second album, uh, I'd even take her there because uh, I just thought, sweetheart, I, you know, I'm Rico Suave, I can't be seen with a girlfriend and just dumbness. And, uh, you know, uh, a couple of months later, after the record release party, my record is released, which was titled Dos, which means the second one, the two. Uh, and it bombed and uh, my video was not getting played on MTV. The single was not getting played on radio. So I started blaming everybody, you know, it's my manager's fault, it's my lawyer's fault, it's a record label. I got, you know, frustrated with a record label and it was everybody but me, you know, when you, you know, you mess up, but just won't admit that it's your fault. I was at that stage and uh, I was being ridiculed on, you know, Arsenio who used to be my, my boy whenever we went to clubs, you know, it was all about the jokes then. And, and uh, Rico Suave became a joke. Uh, I couldn't be in the billboard charts anymore and, and it, was, uh, it was a moment, man, where I looked up to God and said, what did I do? You know, God, what happened? You know, I, I thought, you know, I was your son. I thought that uh, we were going to do this together, that, you know, I, I was planning it out where one day, you know, I'd let them know who you are and I'd get this, this uh, uh, opportunity to tell the world that, you know, Jesus lives and, and you are all that and you are this awesome being. And I had it planned out. I figured that, you know, God, let me... Let me work a lot and let me, you know, keep on achieving these things and keep on, you know, achieving my goals and, and um, you know, let me get some more gold records and let me, you know, uh, let me be a voice.
the 1992 Nosotros Golden Eagle for Outstanding Performer goes to Gerardo. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. I want to thank uh, my Lord and Savior, el Señor Jesucristo, por darme la oportunidad de estar aquí con ustedes. But it didn't work out that way. One day I was on top of the world, and the next day nobody wanted to see me. Um, that pop rap turned into underground rap, and by Vanilla Ice, by MC Hammer, by Rico Suave. Done. One day you're on top of the world and the next day you are you're late on your rent and your car is getting repoed. That was me. You know, I, I had it all in the outer it looked amazing, you know. I had this career and you know I, I put on the good game face. You know, we we uh, celebrity people we, we front a lot. We we make people believe that everything's fine, you know. We get approached by people and they ask you, hey man, how are you? And how are you is a loaded question for us because how are you might be like, what, you don't think I'm doing well? You know, and instead of having a conversation with people, we end up, you know, giving them our biography and, you know, start quoting our resume and all the plans that we have for the future. But at the end of the day, how are you? We can't even answer that because we're not where we want to be. I wasn't. At that moment, man, I, I knew that Hollywood had taken me and just forgotten about me like that. It was over like that. And I was just trying to hang on, you know. Uh, I was trying to get that attention back. And since I didn't get it from TV and I didn't get it from the from the radio stations and from MTV or nothing, I, I needed attention from, from women. So, you know, I'm about to have a baby and I'm still Rico Suave going out every night to clubs and filling that void, you know, that, that space that, you know, I was once up here, but I'm still here. But again, I, I had a good game face. I would go everywhere and people would think that, oh man, you know, He's got all these projects coming. I had nothing coming. All I had was questions, questioning God. You know, how come, why, you know, why me? Hollywood, man, they'll destroy you. I've seen a lot of people, you know, I remember seeing that poor guy, uh, Rob from Milli Vanilli, just drunk and destroyed after all the damaging things that the world did to him. And, uh, Sure enough, he couldn't handle it, man. You know, people think that you're on top of the world, that everything's great. You know, who's the top artist ever? You know, you think about Michael Jackson, look how things ended up for him. 10 years later, we're still talking about him, but it's not about his career anymore, the great songs that he did, but about all the damage he supposedly did. Hollywood will turn on you. Hollywood is fantasy land, okay? I mean, what you see is not what you get. What you see is what artists and celebrities want you to see. You don't see the real deal because they have the same problems that we do. You know, you're not there at home with them. You don't know about the fights. You know, you see Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, you go, what a beautiful couple, and they're adopting all these children. You're like, oh my gosh, uh, amazing, and uh, what a wonderful couple, and the things that they're doing. And, you know, a couple months later, they get divorced, and you're like, what happened? Life happened, realness happened. You know, all that you saw that they made you believe, that they're, you know, uh, the promoters made you believe, that the publicists made you believe, it's not real. So, I didn't have a publicist by then. I, I just had to defend myself and just put on a game face. Everything is fine. So in the middle of all that, Bianca's born, my baby. And I was excited, man. 
You know, she was born, she was a little fuzzy thing. When she was born, she was really hairy. But I was so inspired and I had something to keep, keep me moving because I was so let down by what was going on around me that I needed something to inspire me again. So one day I wake up in the middle of the night and I tell Kat, I say, Kat, man, I, I'm not getting blessed. I know why. I said, I want to get married. And sure enough, yes. And we planned it all out, man. You know, we were talking about it. She called her mom. I called my parents and we're going to get married. And uh, I just wanted to make it right with God. I figured he was not blessing me because I was living in sin. So I'm going to make it right, God. I'm going to get married. Please hook me up. So we did the big old thing in Embody Univision, Telemundo. Gerardo's getting married where Elvis got married in Vegas. Wow. Planned it out, you know, and they got there and the family and, you know, Kathy invited her family. I invited my family. But just a couple of weeks later after that, man, I went back to being the same. All the vows that I made that day didn't mean nothing because uh, I still missed it. The fame, the attention, you know, it's a drug. It's a drug that you cannot have enough of. You know, what do you think all these artists are still trying to make it, man? I know a lot of people, man, they're, they're like in the 50s and, you know, they're like, they're still trying to make it in the business and I'm like, man, Check your purpose. Check in with God, see what He really wants you to do, man, you know. I wasted so much time of my life trying to gain something that I couldn't top, you know. I, I tried. You probably said, you know, there's people that think that, you know, I, uh, I was Rico Suave and then I accepted the Lord and my life changed. No, man, I, I was Rico Suave and I tried to be Rico Suave for another decade. I did another album at Interscope that flopped. Then I went on EMI and did two albums in Spanish. I could never make it in the U.S. I survived with them. Thank the Lord for the Latin countries. You know, uh, I always tell people, Latin people are loyal, man. They kept me alive. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm finagling and trying to see how I'm going to bring uh, money for food and this and that. But somehow every night I was still going out. And uh, one day um, I come home and Kathy's not feeling well. I'm like, what happened? And she goes to the bathroom and she's throwing up. And I'm like, oh, no, God, not right now. Like, you know, I don't know if you've ever been there when you're at your brokest and, you know, it's supposed to be a blessing, but... You're telling God, hold on to that blessing, Lord, not right now, I can't. So, um, sure enough, we find out Kathy's pregnant again. And uh, I'm going to have my second child. And I'm thinking, we can't make it work. So what I was doing was I, I would have Kathy fly back home to uh, Ironton, Ohio, where she's from. And she would come back and fly back over here. And, and, you know, and I'd come here and there and visit. I was like, that whole year that my wife was pregnant, I wasn't even around. And, uh, but uh, one day she, she had to drive to the doctor by herself with my other daughter, Bianca, and take herself there because she, she was, she almost had, she was having contractions. And right there I flew over to, uh, to Ohio and uh, stayed there for about a month. So Nadia Grace is born, and uh, I 
As we leave the hospital, we didn't even have money for diapers. Gerardo Rico Suave didn't have enough money for his baby girl's diapers. I don't know how. I think we wrote a bad check to get out of there. But God always has it planned out, man. Uh, Kathy's grandma basically said, here, here's a credit card. Do what you guys need to do. You know, we'll make it work. So I kept on flying back and forth, went to LA. Uh, I had another record label pick me up and I was uh, traveling in South America, going to Puerto Rico, you know, trying to put out another single. And, you know, they did what they had to do, just help me survive. That was it. You know, I, I could never reach the success of Rico Suave ever again. And, um, I just struggled with that, you know, always feeling like, God, what happened to me? What, you know, what did I do wrong? And I was doing wrong almost every night, you know, but it's always, you look at yourself like it's the unfairness of God, you know, he's being unfair with me. You know, these other people are getting blessed, but I'm not getting blessed, God. They're worse than me. I didn't murder nobody. I mean, we start just making up all these excuses and so we can justify our sin. And uh, I didn't stop. I had a beautiful wife, two beautiful girls, and I didn't stop. So uh, as I'm hustling, I feel like I hustled all my life. As I'm hustling, trying to make it work, um, I started getting these calls, like uh, a friend of mine from from the past, a friend of mine from high school uh, called me and asked me for advice because uh, back in those days, like I told you, I was a young kid that, that, that spoke to God with no shame. I just, you know, I, I would approach people out of nowhere and just tell them about Jesus. And this guy remembers that. And he calls me, he says, you know, Gerardo, I, 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 um, I need to talk to you. And I said, what's up? And he says, uh, I, um, I need some advice. I need some godly counsel. <laughs> he didn't know where I was at with God. And uh, he, uh, he told me, listen, I'm, I'm about to, to get married. I want to get married, uh, but uh, I want God to bless my marriage. But I think I need to tell my girlfriend that I was unfaithful to her this time uh, before, and I want to make it right with God. You know, what do you think? And I went like, you mean you're going to tell your girlfriend that you were unfaithful to her and then you think she's going to marry you? said, don't do that, bro. I said, man, you keep that hush. You know, those things you keep to yourself or tell them to God, but don't tell them to them. And um, I remember he says, well, you know, I don't know. I just feel like God's really putting it in my heart that, uh, that I should tell her, you know, because I, I want my marriage to be blessed. I said, man, bro, I don't know, but I'm, I'm not, I would never do that. So sure enough, I hear that he gets married and I heard that he had the talk with his girlfriend. And now that guy is so blessed, man, he's one of my good friends. So uh, another call comes in and it's my mom talking to me about my cousins. They all became Christians now. And I was like, what? You know, these cousins that I used to talk to, uh, back in the day when I was a young kid again and you know they you know how sometimes we just worry you know we 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 speak life into people and and and, and uh, we tell them about Jesus and they don't react and you know we think that we did something wrong but it's not on our time it's on God's time and they blossomed years later amazing you know I was happy for them I told man mama I'm glad I'm glad that uh, you know Yo-Yo and his family we used to call him Yo-Yo Yo-Yo and his family you know, came to Christ, I'm, I'm static. But then she tells me, yeah, okay, uh, they did, but you know, Yo-Yo wants to talk to you. I said, Yo-Yo wants to talk to me. And I was like, man, I didn't want to tell my mom, but I don't want to talk to him. I know what he's going to try to talk to me about. You know, and he sits right now and I'm the one that's messed up and they know that I'm, you know, that I keep on messing around and they know the lifestyle that I lead and, and they're going to come at me and I, I don't want to hear it, you know. You know, when you're, sinning and 
You just don't want to hear from people. You don't want to see people. You know, your, your lifestyle shows it and, you know, you, you run into people and you're like hide from people because you know that, you know, you might be at the store and you run into your pastor and you run into somebody that, 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 that knows you and knows where you're at. That's where I was at. I was hiding from everybody. So in the middle of all this, I decided to write a letter to my friend Ted Fields at Interscope. And uh, I let him know how things were. I let him know that uh, I tried, that uh, I wanted to show them, you know, that I could do it without him. And it just didn't work out. And I wanted them to give me an opportunity, them being Interscope Records. Ted Field was a founder with Jimmy Iovine. So went back over there, met with everybody, and they gave me a job. They gave me an opportunity. I, I went in there telling them, listen, you guys did the, this with me, the crossover of the Latin artists. You know, let me, give me the opportunity to do with somebody else. And uh, they did, man. They were, they were pretty awesome. Uh, they took me in. I went in there with my tail between my legs. And I had to think about my family more than about my pride. So, man, I had a job. I started working there. So I decided to go to Ecuador because I'm Ecuadorian and, you know, they still wanted me to perform. And uh, I went over there and I remember just, you know, asking God what it was that he wanted from me and why am I over here again? And sure enough, I know why. As soon as I walk into my grandma's house, uh, she tells me that Yo-Yo, my cousin, who just became a Christian, wanted to talk to me. And uh, I avoided him like the plague, so I left. I didn't want to see him, but another day I came by because I was hungry and my grandma cooked so nice and well. So who's uh, sitting on the sofa waiting for me? Yo-Yo. And uh, the first thing he says to me is, uh, hey man, uh, what's going on? How are you? How am I? Man. I'm good, Yo-Yo. I'm, uh, you know, I'm about to start this uh, new album. I'm thinking about. Um, I started working at Interscope, man. Uh, I got things, you know. There's a lot of plans. I want to do this uh, movie coming up. I, you know, uh, I'm gonna get back into uh, acting again. And I, you know, I, I. And in the middle of that, he just says, "Hold on a second. When I meant, how are you? I wanted you to tell me how you were here, spiritually." Um, I just looked at him and said, I'm not doing well. And he said, can I pray for you? And uh, I said, sure. He put his hand on me and um, I just dropped. I fell on the floor and uh, I was just crying and crying and crying. Man. I don't know why we carry such a heavy load. You know, when God's always told us, man, give me your burdens. Right here, you don't have to take that. You don't have to carry That's for me to handle. And I carry that load, man. And, you know, the Bible says that uh, you need to finish the race. Now, the race is not a sprinting. It's sometimes it can be long. And, uh, you can't make it with the weight of a refrigerator on your back. It's impossible. So I let it all out. I let it down that day. And then uh, I got up after just crying till I couldn't cry no more. And he sat me down and he said, so what are you going to do? And everything, all these flashbacks about my life and my purpose and what God had given me. And, and the one thing that I cherished, you know, the one thing that I always wanted to see, people to see that I had going on, even though I had nothing, but I just wanted them to see that I had a good family. I had my wife and I had my kids. That one thing, I wanted God to bless it. So I remembered my friend Sean's story and I said yo yo I, I, I want God to bless my marriage but 
how am I going to tell my wife about all my infidelities? And he said, have faith. Said, have faith. That's it. You don't have another like really good verse for me right now, Yo-Yo? He said, no, have faith. My way back to uh, Los Angeles then, I was on the plane just looking outside the window. I'll never forget, I just, just looking out there going, all right, hey God, um, um, we're doing this. I'm gonna trust you. I know that I've done wrong and I'm, I'm so tired of people looking at my wife thinking she's dumb and I'm so tired of the lies and I want you to bless my marriage. So I came home that day and uh, my wife opened the door and I just told her, sit down, I need to talk to you. And uh, she sat next to me, she said, what's up? I said, sweetheart, I've wronged you. And uh, I told her everything. I, uh, I had to stop because I, she didn't react in anger. She didn't throw anything at me. She was just quiet and in shock. And uh, I remember her just walking upstairs and I stayed in that room, looking up at the ceiling and just going, all right, okay, Lord, here I am. Whatever it is your will, I said, Father, I'm, let's go, I'm all in. And uh, yeah, I felt amazing, this release. But imagine what I did to my wife. So, man, I, I didn't leave the house. She still wanted me around, but she didn't want me around. You know what I'm saying? It's like uh, I went from the doghouse to the kitchen to sleeping on the sofa to trying to get to the room closer to her and uh, in time God started to heal that but she had to see you know the change in me it wasn't about talking anymore because I was a good liar all my life I was a good actor and uh, I didn't want to do that anymore so um, in the midst of all that man you know you, you, you try to fix things and you know the, the enemy is always going to try to rain on your parade and I remember trying to take her to movies and she likes romantic movies and but in the movie that I take her to see the lead guy is unfaithful to the lead girl and here comes the eyes looking at me in the middle of the movie and then you know or you're listening to a song and the song comes up and it's about you know being unfaithful and you're like oh but you got to hang on and you got to know that uh, you know you have to have perseverance. There's so much damage you've done, you know. We as, as men, we think that we try to fix things and everything should be automatic, but you gotta win your wife back. So I held on, man. I, uh, man, I, whatever I didn't do with my wife back then, I gave her all the time in the world and I tried to show her that that dude was dead, that uh, Gerardo Mejia and Jesus was living in me. There was no more Rico Suave. Rico Suave died and uh, was buried under pretty deep. As I'm trying to show my wife that I've changed, man, uh, I was just happy that I was home, that, you know, my girls, and I was happy. And then on top of that, I remember being at Interscope, you know, the, the first artist that I get to sign is Enrique Iglesias. And, you know, we started doing well. You know, uh, I get a nice raise and uh, I get to have uh, a little notoriety again. You know, this guy that was Rico Suave didn't end up, you know, uh, killing himself or, or drinking himself to death or I didn't end up being a, you know, behind the music uh, uh, episode. I did well. I worked hard and uh, you know, we were successful with, with Enrique. I, I was more successful as an executive than I was as an artist. And as all this thing is working out, one day I come home and 
my wife's not feeling too well and she throws up. And I was like, oh, geez, I know this. You know, I, uh, I had gone through this a couple of times already and I was like, all right, good. I said, Lord, you know, I welcome another girl, man. You know, it's, this is going to be awesome. You know, this is, uh, this is my blessing now. Right now we're, you know, we're doing well and we're not broke. And, you know, she can be born, you know, in L.A. and we don't have to move out and, you know, try to make it work because we were doing well. We're being blessed. And uh, I always thought, you know, there's a, there's a saying in, in Spanish. They say, los mujeriegos solo tienen niñas, which means like the womanizer. Uh, you know, they got girls all the time. They, you know, they don't get boys. And I believe that. And in my family, man, you know, I come from a family with my mom had, you know, six sisters. And then, you know, and my dad uh, had, uh, it was mainly boys, a couple of girls, but my brother had two girls and it was just, I was always been surrounded by girls. So I was that I was going to have another girl. And then one day I go um, into the hospital and uh, they were doing the ultrasound on my wife. And I remember so vividly, you know, he goes, oh, I said, what? He goes, look at that. And I looked at the ultrasound. It was this little thing. I was like, what's that? He goes, oh, you're having a boy, Mr. Mejia. And uh, I felt like God was happy with me. Like I felt with God was finally showing me like, look right now, you're, you're finally doing things right, G. And I'm gonna keep on blessing you as long as you live for me. And uh, my life has changed since then. Fast forward to now, I am now in Ashland, Kentucky. I moved over here to be with my family and to be at peace started a uh, Bible study at my home, in a garage with 12 people. It kept growing, we had to move into a yoga studio, my wife's yoga studio. And then after that, we had to rent a building because God kept on bringing people in. A couple of years later, we have our own building and we called it House of Grace. And now my life is the life of a pastor. I don't know how that happened. I don't think in my life I ever planned that out. Ended up being a pastor here in Ashland, Kentucky. God's plans, they were very different than mine. I thought I was gonna end up in the beaches of Ecuador, retiring, fishing for the rest of my life. And here I am in Ashland, Kentucky, pastoring a church, fishing for souls. I thank God for all that he's done in my life. I think that he's still using me. And you never know, there might be another testimony added to this because there's still a lot of work I gotta do. House of Grace is a, is a church full of misfits. I mean, what do you expect if your pastor is Rico Suave, right? But God has blessed us, keeps growing us, and my God, God's plans were so different from mine. And I'm thankful for that. And that boy that was born, man, I love him so much. I love all my kids. I love my wife. It's like, and you put that in comparison to God's love and he shows you that there's no comparison because as much as I love my children, as much as I love my boy, I would never give him his life for anyone or everyone. And God gave his son for me. You can't compare love like that. That's unconditional love. And uh, it wasn't through the hard times that I decided to change. The hard times made me learn, but it was always his love that pulled me in. God bless.